I may have gotten a little excited and started some of these plants just a little too early, but we'll figure out what to do about it somehow. Hey, what's up? My name is Rachel. Welcome back to Oxheart Gardening and the weekly garden tour. And you'll have to excuse my hand. I was at a costume party last night and um, this temporary tattoo pen is actually really hard to wash off. Um, so that's what this is. So it is now been the first week of like real official spring and things are still kind of warm but uh we've been getting some colder temperatures which you know is what i expected because here in south carolina we have like fake spring and then it gets cold again and then eventually real spring comes along and if you don't catch yourself you'll start planting things during fake spring um which i caught myself thinking about i was like oh it's pretty warm maybe i could put my tomatoes out a little early um but i'm really glad that i didn't as you can see my growing setup is pretty darn full and this isn't even including all of my tomatoes um last week i think it was last week i potted up my sweet peppers um, and i started running out of my classic solo cups that i put them in so i had to start putting them in these little four inch pots which is still a step up from where they were in these little six cell trays but they're gonna run out of room again very soon and right here in the middle, these are zinnias and calendula that I had started. I started these zinnias way too early. Like, I should maybe just now be starting them. Um, so these are these are four weeks too old. Um, they can't go outside if there's any danger of frost. So I might have to end up potting up my zinnias, which would be really weird for me. I don't normally do that because, as you can see, they grow really fast. Now the calendula, which is kind of hiding in under here, I bet I could go ahead and put these outside. I could harden them off and put them outside and they would deal with the kind of cooler temperatures and the light frosts just fine, um, which is something that surprised me last year when I was growing them. I had no idea that they were frost hardy. My eggplant that I was struggling to germinate uh, is actually looking a lot better. We've got three sprouts over there um, and these ones are starting to get big enough to where I, at least this one I'm thinking of transplanting and there's a couple more back here um, so eggplant crisis averted they're gonna be a little behind but I think I will have enough plants right in here I also planted some seeds for black cumin and regular cumin this is also fenugreek right here um, and these two I have tried like multiple years in a row now and have just struggled to get germination on these. They're on a heat mat, um, and I don't know why these don't germinate for me. I mean, I've, I bought seeds from a really reputable source. I've put them in nice, moist, warm conditions. Um, they just don't like me for some reason. I don't know, if y'all have tips, if y'all know what I'm doing wrong, why these two never germinate for me, let me know. Hot peppers are looking good. Um, I would also like to transplant these, like pretty soon um, but I am again running out of space as you can see I've got this tray of already potted up sweet peppers we've got ginger down here which we now have two that have sprouted um, I'm still waiting on the turmeric which is those last two back there to come up um, but it it definitely calms me to see multiple gingers starting to sprout up over here and we've also just got even more sweet peppers down here. All right, that's it for inside. Let's go check outside the garden. Oh, and I also just saw this houseplant in my background. Um, a lot of you have asked about my houseplants. So uh, I did film a houseplant tour, but it is posted on Patreon right now. So uh, link in the description to go check out my Patreon. Um, but that video, detailing all my houseplants, where I got them, taking a look at them, that's on there. It's about 60 degrees out here, which is, um, let me check, about 14 um, Celsius. Uh, and in the sun, it's pretty nice, although it's a little chilly when the wind blows. All the tomatoes are out today. I've had to bring them in a couple of nights this week just because it's been getting below 40 degrees out. Um, and some of them look better than others. You can definitely see they're not like the greenest that they could be. 
um, a good illustration of that is you see this peppermint plant that I bought that is very green and these are just a little yellower um, and I'm not entirely sure why usually yellowing like this is a sign of a nitrogen deficiency so I might try giving them a little bit of nitrogen and see if that perks them up um, but I don't know why they would be nitrogen deficient because I put them into fresh um, potting soil. A couple of these also are looking real curly. You see how the leaves aren't flat? Um, like this one. This one's, the leaves are opening up. They're more flat. Um, this one is more curly. And in general, when your tomatoes are doing this, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that something is wrong. Often they'll do this when they feel like they're too hot um, so that they don't evaporate as much water out of their leaves. But these have been like that um, in this weather. It's not very cold and it's just a couple of them. It's not most of them. Like these ones also, you can see no curling. All the leaves open up and they look nice and flat. And when I've seen this before, um, it has been an indication of a disease. Um, so I'm gonna be keeping a very close eye on these and see if they continue to show these curled leaves because that might just mean these are completely uh, not viable to grow with. The rest of the garden is starting to fill out. It's pretty lush, although um, most of the screen that you see is weeds. Like from here, it looks like a sea of dead nettle and a little bit of henbit here in front but mostly just gobs and gobs of flowering dead nettle. Down along this first row, I don't really have like much actually intentionally planted at the moment. I do have um, garlic planted straight down the middle and there are a few older overwintered fava bean plants here. Although the ones around here haven't looked nearly as healthy as the ones in a different area of the garden. These ones are still trying to flower but once you see the other ones, you'll see how uh, unhappy these ones actually look. The garlic in this area is doing great though. I mean, just beautiful and healthy. Not really much affects garlic. I think it's one of the easiest things to grow. You just kind of put it in the ground and forget about it until it's time to harvest. That garlic was planted in late November and in my area, which is upstate South Carolina, that zone, um, I almost said 7B, but recently it got changed to 8A. Um, that will be harvested in about June, maybe July-ish, midsummer really. In the second row, we've got a little bit more going on. This area at the front has a lot of lettuce. We've got garlic and some onions running up the sides. And the lettuce, I think at this point I could start pulling a couple of leaves off of each of them and probably have enough for a really nice little baby green salad. Um, but these are taking a little bit longer to take off than I expected um, last week. Uh, <laughs> but they are very healthy. I mean, look at that color. Um, the varieties I've got here, this is Merlot lettuce. This one is like the most cold hardy one that I've been growing. Right next to it is a dwarf pea. We've got uh, Cosmo romaine. Sweet Valentine Romaine and, um, oh man, I'm blanking on this one. Let's go check the tags. Um, oh, Jericho Romaine. These are all the starts that um, those plants came from. Planted at exactly the same time, they just never got transplanted. Um, and you can see the massive size difference here. Um, but yeah, that one, that last one was Jericho Romaine. And all the rest of these, I honestly, I don't need them. I could have planted them out um, and I probably won't, but I just feel too bad um, like killing them when they still look okay. And so I, I tend to let them sit here until they look so dead that they're not savable and then I compost them. Um, have you ever done anything like that before? I feel like I also do this with stuff in my fridge. Like I have something that I don't, really want to eat like it's it's a little old but it's like it's probably good um but I don't want to eat it but it's still like technically good enough to where I feel bad throwing it out so I just leave it there until it's definitely bad enough to throw out and then I don't feel as bad throwing it out I know that doesn't make like a ton of sense but um 
the human brain. It's, it's a little weird. More of my Brussels sprouts have started going to seed um, and they're starting to make these cute little tiny broccoli clusters, um, which I did eat some of these last week and they were really good. Um, so if you've got Brussels sprouts going to seed, go ahead and try them. They're like little broccolinis. We've also been tracking the aphid damage on this particular plant and you can actually see the size difference in this one versus the one next to it that didn't end up getting any aphids at all. It just, it looks so big and beautiful and healthy. All right, and down the middle here, I have these two big, beautiful arched trellises that don't have literally anything growing on them, um, unless you count the onions that I put out from the edge. Um, I placed these such that I could like plant on the inside of this trellis and feel like this is comfortably not competing. Um, but also I feel like I don't fully utilize all of this space because of the trellis because I walk under the trellises like where that would normally be a row so I try to kind of extend my growing space the best I can around the trellises. I've also been noticing some mushrooms coming up. Um, these look very much to me like dried out wine cap mushrooms. Um, I haven't had just a ton of them and I haven't noticed any of them fresh um, so it's hard to be certain because they dry to this brown color and it's much easier to ID them when they are the beautiful wine-colored caps. Um, but that's this is about the right time of year to start seeing these. And that just means that I gotta be intentional now about coming out and checking for them right after it rains. And back here where I had planted all of those spring brassicas, um, well, there's really only like a couple of them left and I don't really see them getting big enough to produce anything before the summer garden so i was definitely super late on these um, i'll have to note that for next year uh, the timing with stuff like this has been always a little difficult for me um, just because we have such a long warm season and such uh, crazy temperature changes around the season changes i do have a really nice looking spinach here though um, which i have harvested just a little bit off of and uh, of course, I've got the onions all along the side, and then these two that are a little more clumpy looking, those are onions from last year that I left in the ground and I'm letting go to seed on purpose. Onions are biennial, two years. So the first year they make the bulb that you eat, and the second year they go to seed. Um, and if you've bought onion sets, the, sorry, it's super windy out here just randomly. Um, if you've bought onion sets then you might have noticed that a lot of them tend to want to go to seed that's when you buy like the little tiny onion bulbs um, that are like dormant from the store and you plant those um, those are like have already lived their first year so by planting those you're basically planting onions that have already gone through the season of growing the bulb and are thinking about growing you know seeds and reproducing um, so I don't recommend onion sets for a lot of people, especially beginner gardeners, because um, choosing the right places to plant onion sets as far as like climate uh, can be really important to getting bulbs out of those. And most people will have much better success with onion starts, which is actually a little baby plant and not the little dormant bulb. It is also suddenly yard work time everywhere in my neighborhood. Um, so sorry about the background noise, but um, I do want to get this filmed and out to you on time. So we are going to persevere. So I said I was going to show you the fava beans that look much better, and that is these. Um, I'm sure like now that you see these, the difference in those other ones is pretty obvious. These ones have put on a lot more flowers. They're taller, their leaves are... Um, greener looking, I guess. Um, the other ones had a lot of blackening and uh, were a little curled and these ones just like look like healthy plants. Um, they have started putting on little beans. Um, they are currently underneath these dried out flowers. Once these finish drying out, the flower will fall off and the little tiny bean will be right there underneath. Let me see if I can find one around here for you. None to show yet, unfortunately, but very soon we will have teeny tiny little fava beans. Now between the fava beans at the end of this row 
and the Romanescos at the other end. There's not a whole lot in here besides this row of garlic, which, I mean, is also looking very good. This looks even better than the garlic underneath the tomato trellis. It's real stocky. Um, this variety is called Dixon Softneck. I got it from the Experimental Farm Network, and I think this is the third year of me growing it in my garden. Every year I pick out the biggest bulbs and plant not just from the biggest bulbs, but also the biggest cloves. And so every year my garlic gets just like a little bit bigger. Um, so this is a pretty large garlic variety. Speaking of the Romanescos though, I'm letting these go to flower. And I noticed that I'm about to not be able to walk through here because if you know anything about a brassica going to flower, this will explode into like three times its size once it actually really starts going and putting on flowers. Um, but I think it'll be worth it. It'll be beautiful flowers. I'll hopefully get some seeds and um, they're supposed to deter some pests. Um, and like I said last week, I'm not really sure how true that is, that a flowering brassica deters pests, but um, I need the seeds anyway, and it really can't hurt. <laughs> now, going on to the raised bed section of the garden, this area next week is gonna look way different. Um, starting this week, I'm going to come in and mulch this whole area. Um, because I don't want to be mowing in between all my raised beds um, and I kind of want to make it just a nicer place to sit and and spend time outside so all of this is getting mulched and then in a few weeks um, I will be putting in a pergola that me and my dad have been working on I don't know exactly when it's gonna be done yet but I feel like we're getting very close and of course when that's all done there will be a video on his channel detailing how we did it and showing the process um, and if you've never heard me talk about my dad's channel before he is a woodworker who makes some really well done informative videos about the really interesting projects that he does and i always have that channel linked below but it's called the red truck wood shop an example of his work is this garden workbench right here that he built for me out of um, old decking material that he had lying around so last week I had mentioned how I mowed my grass and started putting the clippings on top of here to kind of top up the mulch in these beds. Um, and it was mentioned to me that when they're breaking down it can get pretty hot, um, which I have heard before. I think having the leaves mixed in will help with aeration and have it not get into that really hot breaking down mass. But also um, I am intentionally coming through here and fluffing it up making sure that it is um, all getting kind of dried out so that it doesn't also start heating up in the way that, you know, a big pile of really dense grass clippings can. Um, and these are also on top of the straw that was already here. So there's going to be a little bit of a layer between the grass and the soil and then the roots of these plants. Um, and we'll see. We'll see if this is a major mistake. You know, I do things that I'm not sure about all the time and then watch and see what happens and you guys kind of get to benefit from that by watching me instead of making these mistakes yourself or you know you get to find out that maybe it's not as big of a mistake as everybody says and you've got a brand new free source of mulch for your garden. But yeah mostly these two beds have a lot of perennials growing in them. I've still got this newer raised bed here with my row of onions and like not a whole lot else. I had tried planting beets and radishes here, but um, me being neglectful, they have mostly kind of just died. Um, I think that's the, the soil is drying out really fast because I uncovered them uh, for germination. And uh, yeah, I could have taken better care of them by watering them, but I didn't. And uh, this is the result. I am very happy to report that I have a baby asparagus coming up. I planted some crowns from the store this year and um, they are looking good. I mean, these are, these are delicate and adorable, not edible really at all. I mean, they're edible, but I shouldn't be harvesting them. Um, but they're so cute and I'm really happy to have them. So I've still got two more raised beds to fill and then this one over here, I finally kind of finished up with. Um, it did have leaves covering the whole thing and then we had a really windy day and they all got blown away. So 
I'm gonna have to do some more uh, mowing, I guess. Get some grass clippings to go on top of here. But these are potatoes that had gone to, um, started sprouting, I guess, inside my house. And I put them in here and hopefully uh, we will get some good potatoes. I did intentionally leave the level a little low so that I could kind of mound them up over the course of their growing. I do also want to give you guys an update on my berries. These are blueberries. Um, you can see all their little flowers and some of them are looking a little dry and wrinkled and that could be a good sign. That could mean that they were pollinated um, and then the flower is drying off to soon reveal the fruit coming out underneath. But I haven't been growing blueberries long enough to be able to tell the difference between a flower that's falling off because it wasn't pollinated and a flower that's falling off because it was pollinated. Um, but I think these have been pollinated. If I know anything about other flowers, this top part um, still looks healthy and like it's attached to the plant. And I think, I think if it hadn't been pollinated, then it would be falling off at the stem rather than just the flower part. Um, but again, I don't really know. That's just a guess. I haven't seen any strawberry flowers just yet, but we're still a little ways away from the time that I was getting my first strawberries last year. Um, I'm thinking it'll be soon though that I start getting strawberries. These guys are looking real good. <gasps> oh, you know, I spoke too soon. Look at that. That's a strawberry flower right there just starting to open up. Oh, that's so exciting. Okay, yeah, as soon as I said that, I started seeing strawberry flowers here and there. There's not just a ton, but there's definitely a few, um, which means that there will soon be a lot. And then as far as the blackberries and the raspberries, um, these are also putting on buds. I think if we come over here, this is the most prolific branch. You can see it's just covered in buds. These flowers are gonna open up and then get pollinated and then they will all be berries. Oh, that's so exciting. We also have a few of those buds starting to form on my raspberries as well. You can see them right here in the center, these little buds. Um, and it'll be more obvious when they become flowers, but that is the start of my first season raspberry harvest. All right, so let's move on to the rotating segment this week, which is going to be compost. And specifically, we're gonna talk about how the outdoor compost is doing, how the bokashi is doing, and how my verma composting, my worm composting is going. I definitely did not make enough compost for the whole garden this year, which is very sad. But in here right now, we have some old potting soil. I dumped out a plant that I really, didn't want coming back from the roots so I'm gonna compost it and then you can see all the feathers here I'm also been getting uh, chicken manure from my neighbors and I'm gonna be trying to get more of that this year to kind of try and bulk up my composting operation this is kind of my lazy composting operation um, I could be doing more than just piling it all here um, but I don't um, I know that I could be getting compost a lot faster if I was willing to like stir it all the time and maybe have a three bin setup. But the thing is I'm trying to transition away from a system like that and more into vermicomposting and also a system where stuff composts in place in the garden. I'm gonna bring you guys inside to talk about it more because I know that that um, equipment must be really annoying. So yeah, I am trying to move away from having a big pile and doing the work of moving all the stuff to the pile, letting it compost, and then moving it all the way back to the garden. Um, I've been trying to very slowly incorporate more permaculture principles into my gardening. And so the more stuff that I can pile on the garden to decompose in place, um, the better in my opinion, because not only is that easier for me, but kind of the nutrient loss that happens during composting wouldn't really happen because that's all just going into the soil directly by the plants. Now, talking about the Bokashi setup, um, a big reason that I might keep a small pile around is to kind of do the final decomposition of Bokashi because I don't want to be digging a hole directly in my garden for the Bokashi to decompose in. And it decomposes really fast in that pile of stuff outside. Like we're talking like a couple of weeks max. Um, so throwing it out there, 
that's definitely the easy thing to do with Bokashi. And I will keep doing Bokashi because with Bokashi, if you've never heard me talk about it, um, I've got some videos fully explaining it, but um, the basic idea is that you're pre-fermenting your compost with a lactobacillus bacteria that is then going to make it easy for it to be broken down by the aerobic soil bacteria. Um, and so because of this, you can kind of compost things that like traditional composting says you shouldn't. Um, so that is like meat and cheese and oils, um, leftovers, you know, everything that was like food, it goes in there. So let me, let's actually take a look at that bucket. So this is my current Bokashi bucket. Um, you can see Bokashi grain there on the top and a lot of fresh scraps. Um, and I think this bucket under here is full. Let me check it. Yeah, so this one is in the process of its pre-fermentation. Um, I like to leave it for, well, however long it takes the second bucket to fill up, really. Um, and then this pre-fermented compost will go into the ground. And you don't usually see much change between putting it in and the pre-fermentation happening. It'll get covered with a little bit of white fuzz growth, which is kind of normal. Um, and then the, the breaking down happens really fast once it actually comes in contact with that soil bacteria. And so because that style of composting allows me to compost literally everything just, you know, super easily, I, I will keep doing that. So I will not ever fully be composting in place. Um, and then all that also brings me to my vermicomposting setup, um, which is somewhat new to me, but let's see how the worms are doing. So it'll be a little hard to see into this bin, but I'll see what I can show you. Mostly what we're going to be looking for are the, um, the food that I gave them last and whether or not they're really enjoying that. So just to explain to you what we were just seeing, it is, we saw like a lot of worms kind of congregated on the area where the food was. And the food was like largely broken down and not all the way, but definitely well on its way, which is just a really, really good sign that um, the worms are liking the food that I'm giving them. There's also a ton of baby worms in there, which is a very good sign that the worm population is happy. Um, so yeah worms success so far draco just came up to me and wanted to say hello to everybody hi buddy so if you liked watching that video but didn't like watching with ads um i have good news all of my videos are on my patreon without any ads at all you can access that for just a dollar a month um, you'll be supporting me, you'll be getting ad-free videos, and you'll also be getting videos that I don't post anywhere else, just uh, such as my houseplant tour. Um, there are other things that I offer on my Patreon if you want to throw in a little bit more to support me. There are custom stickers, there is a Discord uh, group that you can join where you can actually chat with me and send me photos of your garden and ask questions and stuff like that. Um, I really love seeing people come in there and chat with me. Um, yeah, so just go check that out and make sure that you check back, check, check back next week for another garden tour. But until then, I wish you all happy gardening. Mm -hmm.